Okay, so in last class, we were talking about something called as attitude estimation. Attitude is determination of roll, pitch, and yaw angles. We will also talk about the position estimation. We'll talk about the velocity estimation, obstacle estimation, and finally we would conclude. So we have been talking about the different measurement principles for accelerometers, uh, for using accelerometers to determine roll and pitch. And I believe I gave an algorithm in the last class on how to find out roll and pitch. Then if you want to find out uh, the roll angle, the equation is given over here. So please understand, these are the two equations that you want to implement for the roll angle determination and the pitch angle determination. So these two are very important equations. And we will try to implement these two equations today on Mambo. I'm going to write these equations down. So for, for in-person in-class students, arc sine a uh, x divided by g and c m is equal to arc sine a y divided by g cosine of theta m. So where ax, ay, and az are the angles that are measured by the sensors. To measure yaw, what you do is you use the output from the magnetometer the magnetometer will give you the three-dimensional uh, magnetic field. The three-dimensional magnetic field may or may not be calibrated. So sometimes you have to calibrate the magnetometer. Many a times the magnetometer is not placed flat. Magnetometer would be at certain angle. So you want to compensate for those angles. So the idea is assuming you know the value of theta m, you know the value of Cm and from your magnetometer, you get three numbers. Magnetometer will give you three numbers. It will give you field strength in X direction, field strength in Y direction and field strength in Z direction. So what you do is you use the first equation, which is Mx multiply that by the cosine of pitch, My multiplied by sine of roll sine of pitch and then mz by cosine of roll and sine of pitch. So first step is always finding out theta and phi. Then once you have the magnetic field mx, my, mz, substitute in that equation and finally find out m, m, x, e, and M, Y, E. Are you with me so far? And once you find out M, X and M, Y, then you have to use this algorithm to find out the actual angle. So assuming uh, your angles, uh, you will use tan inverse, you'll use arc tan, but that arc tan value needs to be corrected depending upon whether your MXE is positive or negative. That will give you the actual value of yaw. Everyone understood this? Any questions? Now let me ask you this. Does Mambo give you magnetometer readings? Oh, no. no. I didn't see because I wasn't Okay. So oh, that is correct. If you want to, there are different ways of doing that. Okay. So, 
and again the magnetic field changes depending upon the location so if you have the latitude and longitude of the coordinate system you can plug that into this magnetic field model and based on the magnetic field model you can find out the offset of the magnetic field and that offset you can add to the actual yaw that will give you the yaw value for that corresponding uh, location and again for autonomous flight control you need to know roll pitch and yaw even for flight uh, level flight you need to control roll and pitch many a times you use additional measurements using gps and gps measurement is combined along with the output from the imu to find the position and navigation information so this is the linear complementary filter in last class i spent uh, half of the class on actually explaining the complementary filter and you have an assignment on complementary filter that is due next thursday remember did anyone try that Nice. Yeah, where, where do we find a simulink model? You will write a simulink model. You will create a simulink model. Using the PowerPoint that you provided us. They who provided? Oh, I didn't provide simulink model. Simulink model. Yeah, it's in the PowerPoint. So discussion, but don't worry. I'll walk you through that process today. Okay. So then. in the last class i spent some time on designing the complementary filter can somebody tell me that uh, just explain this equation to me what is this equation all about yes uh, so there is a high pass filter that's applied and then a low pass filter and then basically used to multiply by the accelerometer and gyroscope because uh, the accelerometer is accurate at low frequency at low speed and the gyroscope is more accurate at high speed very good so, remember this accelerometer is sluggish gyro is quick so you want to low pass output of the accelerometer and high pass the output of the gyro whenever you have the same so if you go to industry and you want to measure a thing and you have two sensors and you realize that one sensor is very good at slow speeds or small range and one sensor is very good at high range use complementary filter do a low pass high pass that will give you very good results and these are the discrete time equations uh, so basically if you replace tau as 0 you will see that you will get 1 Number number one multiplying the accelerometer value and zero multiplying the gyro value. If you have tau as infinity, which means at infinite time, the first number, the first weight will become zero and second weight will become one. Everyone understood this. That is how you remember low pass and high pass filters. That is the Z transform for you in one simple uh, sentence. okay now we talked about the linear standard complementary filter uh, standard complementary filter format is given at the bottom but nevertheless you can implement the top equation it will give you the same answer if you were to implement a complementary filter this is what you would observe or this is what you should observe in uh, mambo you would see the measurement the angle measured from the accelerometer and you will see the angle measured by gyro gyro at angle you would see if you start measuring that can you see wx wx this guy is the output from gyro this guy is the output from gyro this guy is the output from gyro it drifts and this guy dotted line is the output from the accelerometer but it's not accurate so what happens is you combine these two and you get a very reasonable estimate and please understand complementary filter is advantageous when you do not have an underlying system model 
everyone is done with kalman filtering the lab yeah so what is the biggest problem there are two problems with kalman filter tell me what is the first problem okay. you, you can extend it kalman filter for non linear but what is the problem with kalman filter uh, so Model. You need a model. If you do not have a model, Kalman filter cannot be applied. And what is the second? High computation cost. So, for an example, if you have a cheap microcontroller like Arduino, Kalman filter will not run. It will run, or it, but it will run at like one times a second, two times a second, and by that time the aircraft has crashed. So, Kalman filter. computational requirements are very high because of the matrix inversion complementary filter they are very easy to implement so on a simple microcontroller you can implement complementary filters so again complementary filter can be used anywhere where you have a measurement that is accurate at low speed you have a measurement accurate at high speed for an example if you have a gps and you have a yaw angle if you want you can combine gps and the yaw that you get from the gyros or if you have something like you have gps you have yaw and you have magnetometer you can use a complementary filter but at the end remember sum of weights should be equal to 1 right no matter how you add the weights must add to 1 you can actually use cascading uh, complementary filter as well but so in the first stage you will combine magnetometer and the gyro and in the second stage you will take the output of the first stage and fuse that complementarily with gps and i have done all that so it works very nice as a matter of fact the the first adahars that we built for tilt rotor bell 609 we used a uh, mp lab microprocessor they used to run uh, so with the kalman filter we could clock them at 20 this is about 15 years ago 20 25 hertz with complementary filter we could uh, run those at 100 hertz so we had a dsp running the kalman filter at 100 hertz and the microchip microcontrollers running the complementary filter at 100 hertz and then we compared the answers so because in any aircraft system uh, they want not double redundancy they want triple redundancy so every solution has to be calculated by three different processors independently and then finally you would check and two the two ones that match they are flagged correct the next thing is slam which stands for simultaneous localization and mapping this problem is computational problem where you need to know where the agent is located uh, and where is the position with respect to self and the environment there are a lot of slam algorithms slam itself is a field where you can do phd so i am not going to talk about slam in lot more detail but what we would do is Uh, we will try to work out some just like kalman filter lab some slam lab in matlab that will expose you to some of these algorithms that are used for slam implementation so these are the classic uh, slam algorithms you have open slam you have uh, fnu gpl uh, license slam all the way to the slam algorithms that are uh, applied in matlab slam is used for autonomous cars a lot so basically based on the lidar data based on the camera data based on the map data based on the landmark slam is used heavily in um, autonomous cars there is a coursera uh, concentration on driverless cars so the first course that you will do in that concentration is on slam so this is 2d lidar based slam so how does this work so you have a map so which means you have a picture of the environment you have a lidar a lidar is taking two dimensional snapshots and basically what you are going to do is 
you are going to match the image that is constructed by the LIDAR with the image that you are provided with the map. And that is how you will know where you are. And then basically, if you start doing that, you know where you are going. So you will repeat this process repetitively, then you can do uh, the SLAM uh, using some computational algorithm. But SLAM is a computationally intensive algorithm. So if you want to do the, the position, uh, 2D laser based SLAM uh, is used very, very commonly for the ground vehicles, autonomous cars. That's why when you see uh, the Waymo car driving around here, you would see a big dome on the top. That's a LIDAR. Then you would see two small LIDARs up front, two in the back, and then there are cameras. If you just, uh, if you use, uh, or if you own uh, Tesla, Tesla does not use LIDAR. It actually does uh, everything based on cameras. So uh, again, depending upon the cameras that you use, you can use a vision-based SLAM. You could have a, a monocular vision-based SLAM algorithm, uh, wherein again, you would do frame by frame, or you can do keyframe matching and basically identify where the vehicle is. Uh, and you will identify the X, Y, Z positions of the, the vehicle. People can, people have extended this 2D SLAM to 3D SLAM, uh, but if you were to look at when you have the ground plane fixed, 2D SLAM gives very good results. Velocity estimation. Can someone tell me how are the velocities estimated in Telo and Mambo? They are measured using the camera. So Mambo also has a downward facing camera. Uh, and I believe uh, Telo has an IR uh, sensor, right? Uh, so what they do is basically they map the changes in the environment and they do pixel to pixel comparison and find out where the vehicle has moved. Again, optical flow is used in lot of applications. Optical flow is implemented in your cameras. Optical flow is implemented for velocity detection. Your smartphone is capable of running optical flow uh, simulations. So how does optical flow work? Once again, optical flow is something you will study when you uh, study the, uh, the localization course or when you do the Coursera class. I believe in Coursera course, there is uh, optical flow, introduction to optical flow, right? Did anyone do the Coursera course? Okay. But here is the basic concept. Uh, the basic concept is you have one pixel you have the, and that pixel gets moved because the camera is moved. So what we do is we relate change in the position of pixel with the time information. And basically we approximate the velocities as the derivatives. And you have partial i by partial x, partial i by partial y, partial i by partial t, and finally, what you have is you have the equation for the optical flow Vx and Vy. So this is the super duper basic equation. What you do is initially you have the image or for camera, camera doesn't understand the image. It can only understand the pixel and pixel densities. And then you have the changes in the pixel densities. So when the particle moves to X plus dx and y plus dy and you implement this constraint equation because the brightness has to be the same whether you is before or whether it is after and then what you do is if you assume the small parameter assumption like the movement is small you use this expression and then that leads to approximate equation for the velocities and this is what is implemented in TALO and in MAMBO for velocity estimation. 
So next part is there are a lot of open source libraries for optical flow, computer vision toolbox, open CV, machine vision toolbox, and uh, uh, Peter Kong's uh, toolbox. The last part is obstacle determination. How would you determine the obstacle? And the idea is you can determine obstacle using either some type of uh, camera-based technique, some type of uh, line of flight technique or, or line of sight technique, which means you can use some type of a Doppler radar, you can use ultrasonic sensor. The idea is what you estimate is where the obstacle is and what is the shape of the obstacle. Obstacle avoidance itself is a topic for PhD, but what I want to tell you at this point is you can estimate obstacle by identifying the object and constructing a bounding box around object. You can detect an obstacle using some type of sensor like ultrasonic sensor, or you can use some type of LIDAR and try to reconstruct. But two important things that you want to know is where the obstacle is and what is the shape of the obstacle. So those two things will help you uh, avoid the obstacles. And there will be some uh, MATLAB has excellent vision-based toolbox uh, wherein they have implemented determination of vehicle speed based on the vision camera or cam camera, uh, obstacle detection using camera and Talos and Mambos can do obstacle detection avoidance. As you know that you did that lab. So uh, when you look at obstacle avoidance, uh, it, based, it could be based on the vision-based systems or it could be based on additional sensors. So in this lesson, we talked about the state estimation. What are the different techniques for state estimations? And then please understand, uh, there is a lot more math that goes into the state estimation than I presented here, but that math is gonna come to you. Don't worry, it's gonna come to you in next few lessons. So I would promise, uh, I will try to make that math more intuitive and I will try to relate that to the physical quantities. But next few lessons, which are on the, the actual implementation of the math algorithm, the dynamic model, uh, so they will be a little bit math intense. But please understand, all that math has no use unless you understand the physics and you know how to implement that on the actual robot. Okay, with that, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna start with Mambo and I will walk you through the, the Mambo code and then I will modify the code uh, to implement different types of filtering. So online students, bear with me. I'm gonna start my MATLAB and we will work on Mambo. So at this point, if you have access to Mambo, that would be good. If you don't have access to Mambo, that's okay too. So, So open MATLAB. Uh, should I show you the solution or should I show you the problem? Right. Okay. Uh, no, actually, you know what? Uh, I will keep, so, so just, the only problem there is if I, okay. I have a solution that completely I worked out. Uh, if I run that solution 
and if I create the MEX file, uh, then if I try to work out the other solution, uh, it will not work because you will have a baseline uh, hex file in the in the memory. So let let me start let me start from scratch so that we uh, we everyone is on the same page. So open system. This is the worked out solution. So open system parrot getting started. Yeah, the solution. Yeah, this is exactly what I was telling that could happen. Let me close this. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. So what I want you to do is when you open Parrot getting started, you will not see these additional uh, lines. What you will see is uh, you will see input, output, you will see motor vectors. So basically this is where the mixing algorithm works. Online students, can you see my screen? Please open Parrot getting started and your Parrot getting started simulink file would not look like the file that I have here. So what I want you to do is, I want you to double click and what you would observe is your main block here will have DDX, DDY, DDZ, P, Q, R, PRS, altitude sonar, and all these uh, sensor data outputs would be terminated. Are you with me so far? So what I want you to do is I want you to go to Simulink, go to library browser, then commonly used blocks and grab these out blocks and open those terminals. How would you open those terminals? You will open those terminals the way I have opened those terminals. Online students, can you see uh, what I'm, I'm showing here? So I want you to go to simulation, then go to out and then grab, grab this out and connect it to this. Are you with me? Yeah. Just yes, to be clear, you delete the terminators and replace them. Yes. Okay. So, what does a terminator do? Terminate. <laughs> Terminate. <laughs> well, swimming is not a spectator sport. So, if you have it, uh, just what about Eric? You have a computer. Mm -hmm. Where is your computer? Okay. Once this is done, go back to Parrot getting started. Uh, huh? Yeah, I mean, you can, yeah, you can get all these. So DDX is acceleration in X direction. DDY is acceleration in Y direction. DDZ is acceleration in Z direction. PQR are the omega x, omega y, and omega z. And then the pressure gives you uh, the, uh, the, the pressure that is a lot that can be used to find out the altitude. And then you have a sonar, which is the ultrasonic sensor that gives also gives you distance. Are you with me so far? Next step, 
go back to parrot getting started and i want you to carefully observe ddx ddy now you will have ddx ddy ddz you will have p q r you will have output of pressure and you will have output of sonar can you see that now it's not terminated but you get output go back to simulation open library browser and from the library browser open scope grab the scope place over here grab the scope from here place it over here and connect ddx ddy ddz to one scope that will show you the accelerations ax ay az on one scope then pqr connect it to the second scope and then uh, the last one which is pressure and altitude connect it to the third scope are you done hey it's like playing angry birds right right and drop done any errors don't run it don't don't run yet then take the mambo so i will try to run uh, zoom yeah i i can't uh, start video take mambo take a completely charged battery <laughs> and insert in the fan hey okay, that week wait let me finish my thing and then you can uh, do yours don't want uh, okay just, just wait let me finish my exit okay so now mambo should be blinking eyes which means it is ready to pair go on to bluetooth right click join a personal area network uh, everyone remembers right how to pair mambo um we tried doing that earlier it could just be because we were at ASU um but there's like 50,000 bluetooth yeah. devices that showed up and the mambo didn't um oh so, mambo will show yeah. it will be hiding okay but you can arrange those devices by name and then basically select mambo will give you two uh, uh you can try after the class or tomorrow and see if it doesn't work okay but, yeah. so mambo should appear twice because there are two bluetooth profiles for mambo and you should try connecting to one of those profiles and it will work everyone understood this online students can you see mambo blinking you are missing all the fun okay then connect to the mambo connect using access point mambo is always connected using access point it should not give you any other option okay it should don't connect it using ad hoc it will not work if you have rolling spider it will connect using ad hoc but mambo will always connect using access point click connecting and connection successful can you see that trying to connect it <laughs> it will take time 
All right. Now, what I want you to do is, assuming you did everything right, go to hardware. There are two things that I want you to think about. There is an option where the program gets dumped onto the microcontroller, but you do not have access to the states or the sensors. And there is a second option where the program is written to the microcontroller, but you still have access to the sensor and the states. In the earlier version of MATLAB, they call this external mode. The new version of MATLAB, they call it monitor and tune. Are you with me so far? So depending upon what version of MATLAB you have, you could have either external mode or if you have updated the MATLAB, I would think you updated MATLAB because to do the Kalman filter lab, you should have monitor and tune option. Are you with me so far? Click on monitor and tune. And it will go through all its checks. And finally, if everything is okay, it will run. Okay, building. The only thing I want you to observe is can you see? Uh, I, I don't know if you saw it over here. It was it, there was external node over here. It means the core was generated in the external mode. External mode will give you a real time access uh, to all the sensors, all the microcontrol states. So you can actually debug and find out what's going on. Okay, assuming everything is good, this flight control uh, uh, interface will open. And observe what will happen when I press start. It should say preparing to take off. and it should start spinning the props. This is the same thing that we did in the very first exercise, but here is the difference. Click on accelerations, double click on accelerations. Then you see you have ac acceleration data. So see Mambo is, Mambo is going up and down, up and down. You have AX, AY, and you have AZ. Can you see red is AZ? Uh, so let's, can you see yellow is AX? This is the front AX, Y is AY. Then double click on rates. You will see the rates. So when Mambo is stationary, I'm placing Mambo on the desk, you will see that the rates are pretty much zero. Are you with me so far? Huh? Are you running that uh, in uh, uh, extern mode? Okay. Yeah, maybe your Mambo doesn't like you. <laughs> and okay, it stopped. So you are welcome to try this on your own and see if you are getting any data. So I guess 
Only Tatvik has mambo. What's what is your issue? She's trying it. Oh yeah, see, her mambo likes it. <laughs> you guys are missing on all the fun. Okay. So next time, bring mambos. Actually, yeah, next time there will be some heavy duty math, but I will try to soften it with uh, implementation on mambo. So next part is how would you implement a, a complementary filter? Now you are getting? Okay. So I'm not going to give you the solution because remember that is an assignment, but I will get you started. So what I want you to do is, remember we opened all the ports. The first port is AX, okay? First port is AX. What I want you to do is, I want you to add a scope onto the AX port. So DDX is the acceleration in the X direction. Add a scope. What? Is it doing now? Okay, let me sprinkle some magic dust. Yeah, try now. So how would you do this? You will go to simulation. You don't have Simulink in the hardware or anywhere, you will have Simulink when you go to simulation. Open library browser. And from the library browser, you can grab the scope, place it over here and make the connection. I don't know if you see uh, the equation. You see the equation for the equation is written on the board. So this is the same equation that I presented earlier. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Just a second, I'll, I'll correct it. Just be, bear with me for a second. I'm not done yet. So, uh, I wanted to split. Okay, so, then try to open the scope. So again, go back to the hardware, monitor and tune, and open the scope. So this will give you just AX. This will just give you a X and start. And see, and you will see just the value of a X. And next thing is pretty straightforward. Implement this equation AX divided by 9.81. Find the arc sign, but this value is going to be in the radians. So you will have to convert this value into degrees. So for that, 1 pp divided by. Are you, are you with me so far?
and i will show you the, the I'll show you the screen what we should be doing constant should be 1 divided by 9.81 uh, you will multiply with this do the arc sign and then show the that result online students any question so if you online students any question don't i do one by nine okay yeah then actually got actual test So again, go to the hardware, do monitor and tune. Hmm? Oh, I did, I'm sorry, I forgot. Did you do it? Okay. Yeah, I know, smart. Is it working? Double click, and this will give you the values. So five by two, zero, minus five by two, zero. Are you with me so far? Now, what I want you to do is, I want you to implement a second equation in similar. Yeah. What time constant? Oh, you are not. You are not at gyro yet. Just first, first get a, a role. I mean, pitch and roll. And then we will do, you have access to uh, what you will have to do is you'll have to add the timer uh, block and it will give you time. So if you, so yeah, clock. so basically go to simulation. Hold on, hold on one step at a time. So before I answer your advanced questions, let me see if anyone has any other basic questions. So next part, uh, before you go to gyro, I want you to implement the role equation. So how would you implement the role equation? To implement the role equation, you will take AY divided by G. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna copy this. Copy, paste. I'm gonna place this over here. And then 
I'm going to take this guy and connect it to DDY. And then once I do that, I will have the same thing. So here, what I need to implement is I need to implement the product of cosine theta times G. So I will give everyone understood how to implement the product of cosine theta times G. Online students. So if there are any questions, I will, will be happy to answer. So first you get the sensor data then the sensor data. sensor data is over here this sensor data uh, divide that by a constant Whatever thing you get, you need to divide this simulation browser. You need to go to math functions. Yeah, uh, is math? math operations. Multiply. Where is divide? First. Smart. Then take this guy, connect it over here, then grab this guy multiply that convert find cosine so you will have cosine so trigonometric function change that trigonometric function to cosine Grab this from here. The simulink file may not look nice, but at least it will do the thing. So take cosine from here. Grab this from here. Uh, you need uh, basically a reciprocal here. So simulink library browser, math functions. Where is the reciprocal? Yeah, it is divide here. So you can use multiply or divide input. I just want. Yeah, there's a reciprocal square root. There, I thought there was a reciprocal. Okay, if you want, we can just use divide. That's totally fine. Number of inputs. Uh, no, no, not. Uh, 
for correct that is the plan right so this guy get attach so this looks messy huh. but and then uh, where did uh, the last equation is arc sine so i'm going to do arc sine simulink i can do this <coughs> copy paste copy paste and then only thing is you will have to multiply this number by minus one and now go back to hardware but since we are here let, let's multiply that by minus one This is not the most efficient way or the cleanest way of doing a sibling code, but this is the basic and simplest uh, because I know there are some students who have not used simulink in the past. So again, monitor and tune. Is working? Did you get the you are roll angles too? Very good. Okay, online students. Oh, yeah. Oh, you already uh, finished everything? Wow. No, finished. I just did Okay. Online students, any questions? start but i thought when you tried it gave you error this no, time i was doing build and uh, build uh, build and deploy uh, that's why i sprinkled my test okay. and now you should be able to get the roll angle as well Yeah, this is positive rule. Okay. Now the next question is how would you get the timestamp? Did you figure out? Did you add the clock? If I make a note to Trying to compare the time. There are two two ways to address that. The question is 
what frequency the sensor output so okay i, I had to I, I need i need to explain this a little bit just hold on let me okay so next part is i don't know if you see my screen uh let me see so what you have is when you are trying to find out the angle from the gyro assuming the gyro is giving you the data out at particular frequency so for an example i don't think the the mambo gyro is sending you data at 100 hertz that would choke the bluetooth i think it down samples and it sends the data i think either at a 10 hertz or at 2 hertz so you will have to look at what hertz that data is coming out so what that means is i'm going to show you what is happening here if this is the time this time is not the true simulation time because simulation is running at much higher frequency than the data is coming out so what is happening is you are getting this snapshot of data say if it is coming at 2 hertz and i will have to check at what hertz it comes up which means this time is 0 0.5 seconds you agree with me oh yeah clock frequency was much higher yeah yeah this data second data is coming at 0 0.5 hertz this data is coming at 0 0.5 hertz so you really don't need access to the clock what you need is you want to run a running sum of measurement so y is equal to y minus 1 multiplied by delta t you just need to run a running sum of this data and that you can do without access to the clock. Everyone understood this? What is happening? No, no I don't know what delta t is. Basically, uh, the sensors are actually, I'll let you find out what delta t is. So what gyro data, if you were to plot the gyro data, you are gonna get in discrete steps. What I'm saying to find the angle, you would have to just run a running sum, cumulative sum, and that will give you the angle. Try this. If you don't get it, I will explain that to you in on Tuesday's class. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, what you are getting is correct. It, it's a it's sort of a running sum. Uh, that is also called as delta angle if you so because that is the time fraction or what you can do is you can actually get the difference delta omega times delta t so that you will get a difference so you don't need access to the clock data because the simulation clock is going to run at much different frequency than the data that is coming up. Okay, please try doing that and then try to implement Kalman filter. And uh, if not, I will be here on Tuesday to help you out. Okay, I'm gonna stop lecturing and but I will help you uh, with any of your code or if you are implementing that uh, delta value here, uh, I would be happy to help you out. So any questions from my online students?